everybody. This is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well today. So before I got into vintage, when I was about 14 years old, uh, I was into the modern stuff. And for me, the modern stuff would have been near 1980s, Blair Tops or Don Russ. And uh, interestingly, um, the one thing that I really picked up as, as a kid, which was, I think, uh, really ingrained in me uh, through my cousin, was the importance of carrying around a Beckett with you when you're going to a show. And uh, so this is from December of 1988. It happens to be one of my favorite covers of uh, Oral Hershiser. And maybe Oral will get in the Hall of Fame someday. I, I kind of hope so. But uh, even if he doesn't, he's still uh, number one in my book. So um, the one thing that he always said was to have it back it on you because you know um there was this is pre-internet and so we'd always studied a back at the prices and what was going on and when we could uh, before we were going to a, a card shop or in some cases uh we'd go to this place called mcsunny's flea market uh here in massachusetts and it, it was uh, it was something really kind of straight out of Amazing Stories, the TV show, and it had that vibe to it. Uh, you never knew what you were going to see, and uh, you know some kind of antique or whatever. And, and my imagination just took over every time I'd go there. So for me, it's a very special place uh, in my childhood. Um, <laughs> the thing is, there was also uh, a lot of card dealers there too. But the thing is, you didn't want to know or have them know that you had a Beckett on you. So we would roll up the Beckett and put it in our pocket. And then uh, we'd look at the cards and then, you know, talk amongst ourselves and walk away and then flip out the Beckett again and start looking up the prices and then put it back in and then go and try to make a deal with the uh, the seller of the sports cards. Um, and, and I can remember in, in one instance, where uh, I, I grabbed a, a 1982 Topps uh, pack, not really for the cards, but for the gum. I wanted to try it. And this was about maybe 20 years after the, the uh, set was issued. And uh, it, it is not fine wine or whiskey, guys. I, I could just tell you that right now. It, it's more of like a sawdust, um, you know, at this point. It's not good, not good. But hey, you know what? You might you might like it. So uh, anyway, getting back to this. So I, I had actually uh, gone to a, a card store when I was about 14 or 15 years old and I picked out a couple of cards from what the dealer had was uh, three uh, stacks of 1957 tops and uh, even even before I was looking through these cards at, at the shop, uh, I already knew about <laughs> this card right here. And this is uh, Gene Baker, and he's really kind of well known for his error card, which uh, he should be actually well known for a lot more than just an error. However, uh, when I was going through Beckett Magazine, uh, I'm pretty certain that that's where I first encountered the uh, Baker error and I'll show you exactly what that looks like let me see which card it is because I have a few of his cards um, and it looks like this if this thing will ever focus there we go all right so you can see what it says Eugene W Bakep B-A-K-E-P and um, I just I picked that up a couple of years ago and Initially, when I was like 14, 15 years old, I had no idea wh what I was looking, I was supposed to look for um, until uh, a couple of dealer friends of mine told me that it's the the error is not on the front, which I actually thought it was. Um, this is actually his autographed copy, um, and it's the so you already saw what it's supposed to look like, and and this is the non um non error so obviously it if this thing will again focus for me focus focus all right so that was a that was a big fail <laughs> anyway um 
it's not supposed to be fake up, obviously, but I, I was kind of wondering how that actually occurred. And um, on the sheet itself, Baker is, uh, he's next to Al Arbor, and uh, there's no other cards on the sheet that have a an error to it. In fact, uh, it, it may have been that there's a, a piece of lint or something that caught in the roller, and that's what it, what that's what it was. Now, um, it it in my mind, uh, I was thinking like something more grandiose than <laughs> just that, but I, like I showed you. Um, however, um, at, at the time when I was uh, a kid. Uh, collecting this stuff and um, this card in particular was really kind of talked about in, in the same sense as a, a major error would be today um, and, and it was it was a chase card uh, I chased it for sure and uh, I didn't really see any growing up either uh, in my uh, 20s and in my early 30s and well however old I am now you know, and in in any event, uh, uh, yes, I am. Uh, I am forever thirty nine. Anyway, uh, so I I never really saw this this particular error growing up, but I always heard um the stories surrounding it, and it was the uh, one of the biggest pre war error cards uh, of the nineteen fifties. Um, you know, in the same vein as the 1958 Topps Pancho Herrera, which is uh, more well pronounced, and, and that particular error is in the front of the card with the um, the last half of his uh, last name um, being very very light. You can still see that the um, the A uh, in it or the H E R R E. A anyway. Uh, it gets lighter as it goes, or just stops completely. So I think there's maybe two different variations of the Pancho Herrera. Um, in any case, that card is now spoken of more often than uh, the Gene Baker. But um, when I was going through that stack of cards, uh, initially I picked them out because there were um, mostly teams that I wanted that I'd never really kind of heard before or was really kind of fascinated about which you know would be the, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Washington Senators and um, maybe like a few others and, and the, the team the, uh, the the uniforms as well like um, the Cardinals had a, uh, a, a jersey that they only wore in the 1956 season which I thought was really cool especially with the bird on the shoulder uh, that was really neat so I, I chose those and then I, I chose the Gene Baker uh, which and I checked to see if you know if it was the error obviously it wasn't but I wasn't really sure exactly where it was at the time um, but I checked I picked up this card because of the photography and honestly the, the 1957 tops set has great photography for the most part um, and, and even even like in the back of my mind, I wanted to find out who these players were, and uh, and, and I really wanted to find out who <laughs> Gene Baker was, and so uh, that was a little difficult. I mean, you're you're dealing with um, a pretty large uh, age gap there between 1957 and you know 1994, or so uh, 95. So um, I. I actually found his uh, his obituary in the Irish Sports page, and uh, I wanted to read that from you so you guys can get a better um, understanding of who Gene Baker was as a ball player and even a person. So here's what it says in the Quad City Times: In another era with a higher degree of racial tolerance, there is no telling what Gene Baker might have become. As it is, he became a highly respected major league infielder and a valued mem behind the scenes member of the Pittsburgh Pirates organization for more than a quarter century. Baker died at Genesis Medical Center Wednesday at the age of 74, played eight seasons with the Chicago Cubs and Pirates, became baseball's first African-American minor league manager, and
and spent 23 years as the Pirates' chief Midwest scout. He is the only Quad Cityan ever to play in both the World Series and Baseball's All-Star Game. But if it hadn't been for baseball's reluctance to break down racial barriers, Baker might have been achieved much, much more. He didn't make it to the major leagues until he was 28, losing at least four very productive years to prejudice. And after his playing career was over, there were many who felt Baker could have been a great major league manager had the racial climate of the times permitted such a thing. His old friend, Ernie Banks, was so convinced of it that he lobbied for Baker to become the Major League's first African-American manager in his 1971 autobiography, Mr. Cub. He has a great knowledge of baseball and is blessed with the kind of attitude and disposition so important to a manager in this new era, Banks wrote. He is astute, good, good, has good balance and good instincts. He can communicate well with players, umpires, fans, management, and all branches of the news media. I've often thought the term players manager is overworked, but it wouldn't be in Gene Baker's case. He is too well schooled in leadership. It never happened, of course. Baker lived out the last 34 of his years of his life here in Quad Cities in relative obscurity. Bob Oldis, a former teammate with the Pirates, who later became a good friend in the scouting ranks, called Baker one of one of the true gentlemen in the game of baseball. He was one of the all-time great guys, Oldis added. He had no enemies. A modest, pleasant man who was reluctant to talk about himself, Baker seldom spoke in, of the racial barriers that held him back. He encouraged those barriers at a very early age, and he was a standout player on the sandlots of Davenport and was already the star of Davenport High School's basketball team when he went out for the baseball team in 1942. He ended up being cut by coach Midge Meekover. There was no back black ball players on the school's baseball team that year. It made me angry, Baker admitted in 1992, just prior to his induction into the Quad City Sports Hall of Fame. There wasn't much I could do about it. Baker finally got his chance to play baseball when he joined the Navy in 1943. He played with the team at the Atuma Naval Air Station and thereafter being discharged in 1946, he played with several local semi-pro teams. Within two years, he joined the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro, League, Negro American League he batted 294 in 1948 and 285 in 49. In the meantime, Jackie Robinson had broken baseball's long-standing color line, becoming the first black ball player in the major leagues with Brooklyn in 1947. There were four black players in the minors in the majors in 1948 and nine in 1949. They were lumped on three teams the Dodgers, Giants, and Indians. But other clubs were beginning to realize the in inevitability of integration. One of them was the Cubs, who invited three Negro League players for a tryout in the spring of 1950. Baker, Kansas City pitcher Bob Thurman, and second baseman Junior Gilliam of the Baltimore Elite Giants. They purchased Baker's contract from the Monarchs, who replaced him at shortstop with Banks. While the Cubs were willing to sign African-American players, they weren't quite ready to bring them up to the major leagues. They assigned Baker to the AAA team in Springfield and left him there for almost four years. I didn't feel I was any better as a player in 1953 
than I was in 1950, Baker once said. I was ready then, but the Cubs weren't. They waited until the final weeks of the 1953 season to call him. He and Banks both joined the team September 14, 1953, becoming the first two black men to wear a Cubs uniform. Baker, who had always played shortstop, made his debut September 20 at the unfamiliar position of second base. He and Banks, who was five years younger, formed one of the best double play combinations in the major leagues for the next few years. They became known affectionately as the Bingo and B Bango Twins. Baker, a.k.a. Bango, led the league's second baseman in errors all three years, but he also got to balls that flew others could reach. He led the league in putouts and assists in 1955 and double plays in 1956. He also was a productive hitter in the number two slot in the Cubs batting order. In 1955, he was named to the NL All-Star team. He began 1957 season as the Cubs' starting third baseman, but was traded to the Pirates on May 1st after playing 29 games in 1958. He served, severed a knee ligament in a game in St. Louis. The injury sidelined Baker for a year and a half. He finally returned to the Pirates late in the 1960 season, but he wasn't the same. The quickness and the reflexes that had made him a quality infielder were gone. He played in 33 games for Pittsburgh that year, went 0 for 3 as a pinch hitter in the World Series, played nine more games the following season, and was released. It was June 15th, Oldest said. I remember because I got traded the same day. About four or five of us got whacked on, this, on that one day. It w wasn't the end of Baker's baseball career, however. He went to work immediately as the manager of the Pirates Class A farm team in the New York, Pennsylvania League. He also served as a coach in the International League with the Pirates. He returned to the Quad Cities in 1965 and worked for John Deere for a few years before becoming the Pirates Midwest Scout in 1968. He served in that capacity for 23 years. So as much as I really don't like to read out loud, I really did enjoy Don Doxley's article very much, and there was a lot that I took away from it. Um, one of those is that if you wanted to be a writer, um, the easiest thing to do, I think, is to start at the bottom and then work your way up uh, and write, you know, uh, obituaries in the, in the Irish sports pages. And that way you're going to hone in on your skills and pick up tips and tricks along the way. And, uh, and then you can go on in different avenues uh, as well. So the other thing I got from Doxley's article was uh, he's kind of showing us uh, Gene Baker, the ball player, and Gene Baker, the citizen, um, and really kind of like what it was like for Baker that you're not going to get on a baseball card. Now, a you know, baseball card is really um, an advertisement for a product. And uh, I know that's the most simplest def definition of a baseball card. But when I'm looking at this card, uh, I'm seeing a photograph that is locked in a certain period of time uh, it's snapshot, if you will, of American society that is never coming back, uh, either good or bad. And so um, the second thing I'm looking at is not just Gene Baker, but I'm looking at like either the background or uh, particularly what is going on on the card. And uh, his, his jersey really kind of... Uh, speaks to me in a way, or, or uh, it's the first thing that I'm, I'm looking at. And uh, this particular jersey is from 1956. So it's the last year that um, the Cubs had this kind of a jersey, um, the design, in fact. So uh, in 1957 tops, you're going to see two different um, road jerseys, and, and this is the last 
the last kind that they had uh, in 1957. Really, they they had um, a, a road jersey that had the words Cubs or Chicago, and then Cubs at the bottom, and um, that was kind of long. That I'm sorry, that didn't really last that long, and, and neither did the zipper. In fact, so um, I think the Cubs were actually the first team to actually sport a zipper jersey, uh, and then maybe even the uh, New York Giants from about 1937 or so. Um, and I, I can't imagine that a zipper jersey was all that comfortable or easy, uh, especially if it got caught or stuck. Um, and so I believe 1959 was maybe the last year that uh, zipper jerseys were in, in the majors. And so um, I'm looking at that. As far as uh, value is concerned with this particular error card, um, like I said before, I'm not seeing it in hobby history. I don't know who it was who found uh, that particular error card um, or, or when, but I'm also not really seeing it in the price guides either. Uh, I, I Like I said before, I checked and it's it's vague. So um, it is in the, in the 2020 Beckett Vintage and uh, they list it as I believe 220 to 350 dollars. Now, it's certainly not anything I paid for. Um, I paid vastly, vastly undervalued, um, and and so you could actually walk away with this card for maybe under a hundred bucks. You know, um, the thing is, if you uh, if you don't know what it is or um, where it is, you you can actually skip through it, and I've I've, I've actually um, met a dealer, or a friend of mine, who um, found one in a stack of cards uh, long ago, and he paid really very cheap for it. Um, so the error is out there, and I don't think it's all that popular, but uh, it's it's one of the maybe top pre-war errors from especially the 1950s that uh, it doesn't really give a whole lot of attention these days. But guys, I really wanted to uh, talk about this and I also wanted to get your thoughts on not just Gene Baker, but um, the 1957 top set as well. And uh, you're gonna notice that the 1957 top set, you can go in a lot of directions with it. And that's because, um, it's the first year that has your standard uh, issued um, dimensions to it. And uh, also the first year that has the uh, this kind of a photography. I, I think it's Kodachrome, but I'm not quite sure. Um, it, it also has 22 Hall of Famers in it. The, uh, the last two, uh, Minnie Minoso and Gil Hodges uh, were just added to the Hall of Fame and congratulations to those two and their families. I think that's fantastic. It's been a long time coming for both of those ballplayers. Um, and if you're into the Negro Leagues, uh, this set actually, I believe, has about uh, a dozen or more former Negro League ballplayers. And um, uh, Willie Mays is one. Dave Pope is another. Um, who else? Uh, let's see. Larry Dolby, I think Hank Thomas, Hank Thompson, uh, Don Newcomb, I believe, obviously Minnie Minoso, uh, and, and so it, it's it's pretty it's pretty cool actually. Um, if you could add a few of those to your collection, also if you if you do want to learn more about the Negro Leagues as well, there are a lot of books out there, and um, one of the ones that uh, I wanted to tell you about today is from a friend of mine, Cam Perrin and uh, Nick Childs. And it's actually forwarded by uh, Hank Aaron as well. And it's the comeback season. And uh, one of the things I like about it is uh, not just that a friend of mine wrote it, but um, it goes through uh, Cam's 
research and, and how he got to know a lot of the Negro League ball players and uh, help them out with their pensions and actually talk to them and, and getting to know them as people. So uh, you might really like that book. I, I know I did. And so uh, with that, guys, I really appreciate you sticking around and giving a listen to what I have to say. And uh, give a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, until the next time, have a good one, guys. And I'll, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.